All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our virtual planetarium, the Sky Tonight presentation. My name is Becca, my pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be your moderator. So what that means is I will be taking your questions and observations and sharing them with our educator. Now, if you're joining us on Zoom and would like closed captions, you can click on the closed caption button and click show subtitles. If you're joining us on uh, Facebook and YouTube, we are very excited that you're joining us today. Unfortunately, we cannot see any of your comments at this time, but we hope that you enjoy following along. If you would like to submit any questions or comments on Zoom, you can do that by finding the Q&A box and typing in any of your questions or comments. Now, I think it's time that we get started and have our educator introduce herself. Thanks, Becca. Hi, everybody. My name's Katie. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And today I'm going to be your educator as we look at what is up in the sky tonight. Um, so I'm going to switch over to our software today. We're going to be using Stellarium. This is a free and open source software that you can download um, online. You can go to stellarium.org. I think we'll have the, um, the link for you at the end if you are interested in playing around with it yourself. Um, so I have this set so that we are viewing the nighttime sky from around Boston, but without all the extra light pollution at around 10 p.m. tonight. Um, so the sky will be pretty similar if you live anywhere um, close to the same latitude as Boston. Um, but it's also always interesting to know where people are tuning in from as well. So we can always, uh, in Stellarium, you can always change where you're viewing from, which is really nice. And it's got pretty much every location on the Earth. Um, and also you can look at the sky from other planets as well, which is pretty cool. So I have us looking west right now because there's one object in particular um, that is of great importance right now because of the Perseverance landing that happened yesterday. And I am talking about the planet Mars which is visible in the nighttime sky um, over in the west. So you might have noticed there is a very bright red object right over here. That is the planet Mars. You'll notice there are also some other very bright objects in this area, some of them with a reddish hue. So it can be um, kind of tough to spot it sometimes if you don't know exactly where you're looking. Like this star right over here kind of has a, a reddish hue to it, and that's because it's a red star. Um, so you'll want to look kind of low in the western, um, on the western horizon around 10 p.m. tonight. So let's talk more about Mars. So we can zoom in a bit. So yesterday, the Perseverance rover landed on the surface of Mars. After a long journey, it launched back in July. So it took about seven months or so to actually get there. And anytime we send anything to Mars, it takes somewhere between six to 10 months um, for it to get there, just based on where the Earth and Mars are in their orbits around the sun. Um, so there's always a good window about every two years or so to send spacecraft to Mars. And this particular rover is really exciting because it's got a buddy on board, uh, not a human one, but a, a drone actually, or like a little helicopter um, called an Ingenuity that is going to deploy sometime in the next month or so and actually fly around on the surface of Mars and look at different areas. This is the first time that anyone has ever um, flown a helicopter um, or a mini, very small helicopter um, on Mars. So the Perseverance rover, its main goal is to look for signs of ancient life on the red planet. And so its destination is uh, a a perfect spot for that, according to um, astronomers and astrogeologists, because it's landing in a place called Jezero Crater, that's where it is right now, um, which is thought to be the site of an ancient lake. So a very long time ago, we're talking billions of years ago in the kind of the earlier days of the solar system, um, Mars used to be a much different place than it is today. So. Today it's very dry. It's kind of like a desert, but it's a very, very cold desert. And it used to be a lot warmer because 
Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere. And this comes from a lot of the data sent back from previous rover, rovers and orbiters that we've already sent to Mars. And that thicker atmosphere allows the planet to trap in more heat from the sun. So the Earth's atmosphere traps in just enough heat so that we don't completely freeze or completely boil away. Um, it's trapping in a very good amount that allows for liquid water on the surface. On Mars, Mars's atmosphere is very, very thin. Uh, so it doesn't trap in much heat at all. And that's why there's no significant amounts of liquid water on the surface of Mars. Billions of years ago, it had a thicker atmosphere. And so liquid water was able to stay in its liquid form on the surface of Mars. And we see evidence of that from rock samples and Martian meteorites that we found here on Earth, believe it or not. Um, so there's lots of evidence for past water on Mars. And this crater is one of those areas that is thought to have had a really significant amount of liquid water. And water can preserve certain types of microfossils, certain sediments um, that are left over from ancient water can preserve microfossils. So that is what the Perseverance rover is gonna be looking for among many other things um, to see if there is any evidence of past life on Mars or maybe even present life. Currently, we have no evidence whatsoever for any kind of life on the red planet, um, but you know, we are always searching. The Perseverance rover is also a important step to learning more about Mars to hopefully one day uh, send humans on this very, very long journey. So I do wanna just show you before we start talking about um, some constellations that we can see, I wanna show you some pictures from the Perseverance rover that have already come back. Um, so this is the very first picture that it sent back. Um, right after it landed. So you can actually still see it's a little bit of a fuzzy image because there's still a protective cover over the lens and there's a lot of dust in the area just because of the um, entire landing process. And then it also took a picture um, from behind. So this is what it looks like from the other point of view. Um, and this is inside of Jezero Crater. You can see it's very rocky very dry looking. Um, and then they, it also came back with a uh, color photo as well. This is really cool to see. You can see some mountains off in the distance there, as well as the shadow of the rover itself. And then finally, this picture I think is really cool. Um, this picture was taken by the jetpack, which was part of the um, entry landing descent vehicle, essentially, that um, dropped the rover down on these cables and slowly lowered it to the surface. So this was taken by um, that piece of equipment be right before Perseverance touched down on Mars. All right, so I just wanted to share those really cool pictures. There's gonna be so many more coming back. Um, there, it's also a really fun Twitter account to follow uh, is the Perseverance Rover because it talks in first person, which is pretty cute as well. Um, all right, so Becca, have we had any questions come in about Mars or anything really? Sure, so we do have a question actually that pertains to the view we're looking at right now. Uh, Emma, age seven, is wanting to know what is the planet that's kind of right next to it? Or I guess if that's not a planet, what is that small round circle? Yeah, so that is a really good question. So this is actually a star. And if we zoom out, I'll be able to tell you um, more of which one it is in particular. Let's see, we have Taurus. All right, let's zoom back in and I'll click on it because I don't know what star that is. Let's see. Oh, it's the Martian moon. <laughs> I should have known that. It is very close to Mars. This is called Phobos. It's very fuzzy. It's too bad they didn't put um, an actual image of it in here. It'd be easier to recognize. But this is one of the moons of Mars called Phobos. It does have another one, which, ah, right up here. This is the other one called Deimos. And these moons are very small. They're much smaller than our own moon. And so they're not actually round. They're shaped more like lumpy potatoes because they're not big enough for gravity to kind of push them into or kind of shape them into a sphere. Um, you have to have enough mass or be made up of enough stuff in order to be round. So these two moons are not big enough. And so they are shaped like 
potatoes or asteroids? That's a great question. I do like Mars's potato shaped moon. <laughs> Uh, awesome. So kind of based on Mars compared to the size of the moons, uh, Liddy age five is wondering how big is Mars? Yeah, another great question. Um, Mars is smaller than the Earth. It's just over half the size of the Earth. So it's bigger than Earth's moon, but smaller than the Earth is, if that kind of helps put it into scale. Yeah, and that actually goes along really nicely with this question from grades five and six in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, they're wondering how many Marses can you fit into an Earth or vice versa? Ooh, that is a good question. So if Mars is just over half the size of the Earth, um, well, it's kind of tough because they're both round. So that would be, it would probably be around two, maybe a little less. <laughs> very cool not like as many earths as you can fit into jupiter right yeah which is a lot that's like 1300 earths you could fit into jupiter awesome and while we're still on mars uh we faith age 10 has a question about who is the first person to discover mars that is another really good question um that i'm not sure even has an answer because mars is visible in the nighttime sky so you could just go out and look with your eyes and be able to see Mars in the sky. And this is what it looks like. So humans, for as long as they've been around, have been able to look up at the sky and see the planet Mars. Um, now, if you're talking about looking at it through a telescope, um, I'm actually not sure. But humans have been able to see certain planets in the sky, the ones that are a little bit closer. Um, so basically Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are the planets you're able to see with your eyes at night, as long as they're you know, in the right positioning so that you can, you can actually spot them. Um, so the, they don't really have discoverers because they didn't need telescopes um, in order to see these planets. So it's kind of a hard question to answer. And I'm not sure that there is any one particular discoverer um, of Mars. Awesome. And we do have more questions if you think we have a few moments before moving on. Uh, yeah, we could take another question. Sure. So, uh, wow, so many awesome questions here. Um, so here's kind of combining two. Why is Mars red and cold? Awesome. Yeah. Good, great questions. So um, Mars is red because of what is in its soil. There's a lot of iron in the soil on Mars. And if you've ever left like a bicycle outside for too long, or maybe it rained or something like that, you've probably noticed that it gets rusty. Um, and rust has that kind of burnt orangey color. That's basically what's happening along most of the surface of Mars is that iron that's in the soil is oxidizing or getting exposed to a very teensy tiny, teeny tiny amount of oxygen in the Martian atmosphere and then rusting. So the reason that Mars is red is because it's covered in rust. Um, and the reason it's cold is because of a couple of different things. Um, it's farther away from the sun than the Earth is. So it's the fourth planet, Earth is the third. Uh, and then also it has a very thin atmosphere. So atmospheres act like blankets, they trap in heat. Mars has a very thin blanket. It would be like using a sheet um, at night when you're going to sleep in the winter trying to stay warm, it wouldn't do a very good job. And so Mars is also cold because of that reason. All right, awesome question so far. And it sounds like we've got a lot of them coming in. So I will try to leave um, a good amount of time at the end of the program to answer some more. But I do wanna point out some constellations that you can also see in the nighttime sky, um, as well as the moon. There's the moon right there, in case you wanted to get a close up view. Very cool looking. This is first quarter. So we're going to be seeing more and more of the daytime side of the moon lit up as we progress through uh, the next few weeks. And I'm going to turn our attention over to the northern sky um, because, or maybe like the northeastern part of the sky, um, because there are a couple of constellations that are starting to come into view. 
that are springtime constellations. So our first little glimpse of spring we can see in the nighttime sky, which is always exciting if uh, you live in a very cold place or maybe you don't enjoy the winter very much. Um, but in the Northeast, we can find the very um, prominent group of stars called the Big Dipper right here. Kind of looks like it's standing on its handle. So we've got one, two, three stars in the handle and then four in the bowl of the Big Dipper. And this constellation is actually much bigger than just the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is just a, a part of it. Um, the entire constellation is known as Ursa Major in Greek and Roman mythologies, which are the constellations that I will be pointing out today. Um, but lots of different cultures all around the world have different names for different stars and constellations as well. And I really like this um, group of stars in particular because it's easy it's usable to find other constellations. So you can actually use the handle here to find another constellation. So if we follow the arc, we can arc to a very bright star, really low on the Eastern horizon, conveniently named Arcturus. And this star is part of the constellation Bootes, which is supposed to be um, a guy wearing a robe, carrying a stick and herding, like a shepherd herding the bear, which is Ursa Major across the sky. So this is obviously part of mythology, um, but I always like to bring it up just because the actual stick figures look so far from what they're supposed to be. So it just shows you how wonderful the human imagination can really be. Um, and then of course I can help you out by adding some artwork so that you can uh, see what the ancient people might have saw when they were looking up at the sky. Um, so here's Bootes, uh, the bear herdsman, and there's Ursa Major with a very long bushy tail, which is very weird, but so be it. <laughs> there's also a little bear that you can find with the Big Dipper right over here. You can follow these two end stars straight in a line and the first star that you come to is where you'll stop. Um, and if you're looking in the nighttime sky and you're trying to figure out how far to go, um, it's about five times the distance in between these two stars here. And that'll bring us to Polaris, also known as the North Star and the Little Dipper or Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, which is very cute. And it has an even longer tail. So we've got the bears and the bear herdsman named Bootes, which is a spring constellation. Um, and then one other constellation that is pretty indicative of the spring is also um, discoverable via the Big Dipper. Instead of taking the front two stars, you can take the back two and follow them in the opposite direction until you come upon a group of stars that kind of looks like a backward question mark. So if we follow it right over here, you can kind of make out a backward question mark right here. And this is the constellation Leo the lion. I could also see it being maybe like a mouse or a coat hanger or something like that. Um, but there it is, nice and big in the sky, another spring constellation. All right, uh, so that's what's going on over in the northern part of the sky. But if we go back toward the sky that we were looking at, kind of around where Mars is, um, this is a lot of um, winter constellations, very prominent constellations that are visible in the wintertime. And you can see since they're headed toward the western horizon, they're starting to set for the year. So we've got spring constellations starting to rise and being more visible, whereas the winter constellations are getting lower and lower in the sky until we can't see them anymore. Um, so there are a couple that are, are have already been highlighted just because I've clicked on some of the objects that are inside of these constellations. But this particular one here is a bull, also known as Taurus the bull. And this very bright star represents its angry eye. This is a very massive um, orange giant star. 
So you might have noticed that stars do have different colors. Um, I mentioned there are red stars, we've got orange stars, and there are even some blue stars as well. And you can actually find a blue star in this part of the sky, not too far away from Aldebaran. So right pretty much directly in the southwestern part of the sky, we come upon another very, very familiar constellation or a well-known one just because it's so bright. Um, and that's Orion. And the easiest way to find Orion is to look for the three stars in his belt. They're of kind of equal brightness or very close to equal brightness. And they're roughly in a straight line. So if you're looking at these three stars right here, you have found his belt. And then from there, finding the rest of the constellations pretty easy. You can come up right here to this very bright star and then up here and then you can find his legs, you come down here. And that's pretty much the whole thing. And then he's got a really teeny tiny head up here. So this constellation actually kind of looks like what it's supposed to be, which is a person or a hunter, Orion the hunter. And in depending on the artwork that you see, sometimes this is a bow and arrow or a sword and a shield. In this case, it looks like um, he had just gone hunting and has um, the animal here and something else up here. All of the different artworks are um, a little bit different, which is kind of cool. Orion's one of my favorite constellations because there's so many interesting objects in it. And as I promised, there is a blue star in Orion, which is down here by his foot. It's called Rigel. And it's a very massive, very, very hot star. Um, blue stars actually tend to be much hotter than red stars because, um, or despite what our sink faucets say, right? Because blue is usually associated with cold and red is associated with hot, but that's not the case for stars. Um, anything that is blue is usually much hotter and more energetic than things that are red because they're emitting higher energy light or high frequency radiation, which tends to be on the bluer side of things. All right, so I gave a lot of information there. So I'm gonna pause and take some more questions. Nick, any any questions, Becca, like Mars, any about any of the constellations? Sure, I figured since we are looking at some constellations, we'll start with a couple of questions around that. Uh, someone is asking, what is the biggest constellation and what is the smallest? Now I have an idea for the smallest and it might be my favorite constellation, so. Yeah. Um, what? Wait. What? Uh. What's your favorite? That well, might be the smallest. My favorite is uh needs a lot of imagination. <laughs> it does, and it's actually pretty close by here. If I'm thinking of the same one that you're thinking of, you definitely are. <laughs> so the smallest constellation, or at least one of the smallest, because some of them get pretty tiny. So I actually don't know exactly which one is the smallest, but um, there's one in this area here. So if we take um, Orion's belt and we kind of go down in this part of the sky, we can see um, the brightest star in the sky. This is called Sirius and it's part of Canis Major or the big dog. But then if we just hop right over here, um, this star is called Procyon and it's part of Canis Minor, which is literally just these two stars and a very tiny dog. That is but, definitely my favorite constellation. And it <laughs> definitely requires a lot of imagination. Maybe it's more like a hot dog or like That's a Datsun. Yeah. <laughs> and then for largest constellations, um, I think that the largest one is Hydra which is um, like a very long constellation because it's like a serpent. And I actually don't know if it's visible right now, but what I can do is turn, I'm gonna turn on all of the constellations and that's not how you do it and see if we can find it. Uh, yes, right in here. All right, let's see if we can find Hydra. I'm gonna turn off the artwork just to help us a little bit. 
And it looks like I'm not seeing it right now. Oh, right over here. This, here it is. So you can see it's a very long constellation. So it doesn't take up a lot of space, like width wise, it's just very long. And I think that this one is considered the largest constellation because it continues and it keeps going down a little bit below the horizon there. Cool. Um, and so Anushka age 11 is wondering how do these constellations get their names? Is it because of what they are shaped? Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, so I, I, the, the naming conventions, uh, at least for these really ancient ones, I think came about a very long time ago, but there are also a lot of more recent modern constellations that get named by the International Astronomical Union. Um, so you'll see that there are a lot of small constellations that represent um, different instruments used either in navigation on the seas or for um, looking at the night sky. Like there's a telescope constellation, there's a microscope, there's a compass, um, and a lot of navigational tools that you would use on the sea. So right here, I'm pointing at a compass. And a lot of these are actually in the Southern hemisphere. So you wouldn't normally see them up here or you wouldn't ever really see them up here in the Northern hemisphere. Um, but these are all named by the International Astronomical Union. The other ones, the ancient Greek and Roman ones, I'm not sure exactly who named them, but they definitely came up with the shapes and what they are, which definitely lends to the name of a lot of these constellations. And again, these are just the Greek and Roman slash modern, like the Western constellations, but there are so many others that probably have way different naming conventions um, out there. Awesome, and we are just about out of time. So I think I'll combine uh, two questions for our very last one. A uh, question that came in at the very, very beginning of this program that I think would be good to kind of wrap up with, was how big is a star? But also we had a question that came in um, wondering why there are different colors of stars. Yeah, okay, great questions. So um, when we're talking about the size of a star, it's a pretty big range. Stars can be pretty small, they can be really big, but just to try to give you some scale. So the sun, is considered a very average star. And if we were to fill it with Earths, you could fit about 1 million Earths inside of the sun. And that's an average star. There are some stars that can actually be um, more Jupiter sized. So not quite as small as Jupiter, but um, kind of around there. And then there are stars that are insanely massive that could fit thousands and thousands of our sun inside of it. So it's a really big range, um, but the sun is average and you could fit about a million Earths inside of the sun. Uh, and then the other question is why do they come in different colors? They're different colors because they're different temperatures. So the color of a star directly relates to its temperature. And that all has to do with the um, process that's going on in the core that keeps the star fueled throughout its life. It's a process called nuclear fusion. And depending on how big the star is and how quickly this process is happening, stars can emit different amounts of heat. Um, and then that translates into the color. So stars that are emitting a ton of energy, a ton of heat are going to be bluer. And then stars that aren't quite as hot um, are going to be on the redder side of things. So red stars are generally a few thousand degrees on their surface, whereas blue stars are generally tens of thousands of degrees on their surface. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie, for all of that information. Unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. So I'm going to ask you to say your goodbyes. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for all of your questions. Thank you. And thank you all for your great questions and uh, comments and observations throughout the program. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of your questions, but we will be doing more programs like this in the future. In fact, 
next week. So if you want to check out all of our virtual offerings, any more of our virtual planetarium shows, you can go to mos.org slash mos at home. If you enjoyed this program and are able and willing to support the museum, you can go to engage.mos.org slash welcome to support programs like this. And finally, we were able to use Stellarium, uh, which there's a link here at www.stellarium.org um, for this presentation. So if you would like to try it out too, you can download it and play around with the stars. Thank you everyone for coming and I hope you have a great rest of your Friday.